I'm Keel Reinen with Trek Segafredo World Tour Racing Team, and I'm here helping present the Group Ride Podcast. Welcome to Episode 16 of the Group Ride Podcast. This is a podcast for cycling in the Pacific Northwest and beyond. I'm your host, Wes Salmon, and today on the show, we head down to the Seward Park Thursday Night Race Series, where I chat with Bainbridge Island native Kiel Reinen about life as a UCI World Tour Pro riding for Trek Segafredo. After that, I announced the third of five winners of our iBike PNW giveaway, where you can win weekend passes to the Gigantic Bicycle Festival later this year by showing off your Pacific Northwest cycling photos on Twitter and Instagram. And finally, if you've ridden around the east side of Seattle long enough, you've probably seen my next guest. He rides a very interesting bike. Clip in, riders. The Group Ride Podcast is rolling out. Do you enjoy the show and crave ways to show it off to your cycling friends? Then you're in luck. The Group Ride Club is exactly what you need. The Group Ride Club is the only way to get Group Ride Podcast swag other than tracking me down at an event. In addition to sporting the nifty Group Ride street sign logo, signing up for the club also helps us move towards a few goals we have for the year. Once we hit 50 club members, I'll kick off the creation of our official Group Ride Podcast custom jersey. At 100 members, we'll unlock the special live event podcast, where I'll do a live recording of the show in the Seattle area where the listeners can attend and most importantly, get involved. And the final goal is the 250 member mark. Once we hit 250, I'll be setting up a club members only group ride in the Seattle area. It costs as little as $1 to become a member. So check it out at thegroupride.com slash club. Up next, I catch up with Bainbridge Island native Kiel Reinen. I caught up with Kiel a few weeks ago at the Seward Park Thursday Night Race Series. Kiel has been a professional racer since 2008, where he got his start with the Jelly Belly Cycling Team. In 2016, Kiel made the jump to the UCI World Tour, joining the Trek Segafredo team, which included greats such as Fabian Cancellara, Alberto Contador, and John Degenkolb. We had a quick chat about life in the World Tour and splitting his time between Spain and his home in Bainbridge Island. You are a local guy, uh, and you were in continental racing locally. Then you went to Trek Segafredo. So tell me what you feel the biggest difference was between racing continentally and racing in the World Tour. It's a tough question. Um, you know, one of the big things that people don't realize, for example, this year's Tour of California, there was a couple of days where I really wanted to be up the road in the break. I thought it was a good opportunity for the, the break to stick. And uh, when you have a World Tour jersey on your back, it's a lot harder to get up the road. They're not inclined to let you because maybe you have a sprinter on your team, and if, if you don't have someone in the breakaway, they know you'll help work to bring it back. So that's, you know, that part's a little bit frustrating sometimes. And then the other thing is, you know, when you get results on a world tour team, there's sort of an expectation of results. So you're, you leave the race satisfied, but um, not sort of as elated as you might if you're coming in as an underdog and, and winning um, when no one expects it. This year, you're uh, moving back to uh, Europe, I believe, to go to your next race. What is your next event? Tour de Suisse starts uh, June 10th. And what are your goals on that race? Um, John Degenkolb will be there for us, and I'll be uh, one of his key lead-out guys there. Um, we looked at the, the route. looks like maybe three, three good stages, good opportunities for him. So those will be um, the important days for, for us, and uh, definitely enjoy working for him. He's been a great, great teammate, and I think he and, and Kuhn and I all, all work well together. Um, when you finish this year's tour, uh, and... Uh the real deal, authentic. Yeah, no kidding. So when the season's over, uh, what are your plans? Um, actually, I'm from, born and raised on Bainbridge Island. I have moved back now about a year ago. Um, of course, that's more theory than, than uh, in actual practice because we're on the road a lot. But um, when I am in the States now, I am based on the island uh, where I grew up. And, and when we're in Europe, we're in Girona in Spain. And how do you like Spain? Uh, it's good. It's not as good as home, but uh, we do our, our best with it over there. And um, my wife's quite adept now at uh, handling everything over there. I think this is our, our sixth year that staying there during, uh, especially like the spring spring season. Um, and it's nice to get out of the rain for a bit, but I, uh, I love where I grew up and I, I miss it when I'm gone. So once you're all done and retired in many, many years from now, what are your plans cycling? Somewhere between two months and <laughs> many, many years. Um that's a great question. I spent a lot of time thinking about that. I have a lot of a lot of hobbies. I like woodworking, crabbing. Um, 
and uh, family is extremely important to me and I've got a lot of family out here so I see myself staying put out here um, my dad actually owns a construction business on the island and has for about more than 30 years now um, so maybe work with him maybe be involved in something in the, the industry I also love food so anyway, anything in there very cool well thank you so much for being on the show sir yeah absolutely it's my pleasure and it's great to be back here in the northwest So recently, there have been a number of pro cyclists, as well as other well-known celebrities, have issues while riding a bike. Chris Froome was the victim of a hit-and-run earlier this year. And last year, the giant Alpecin team had a head-on collision with a car during a training exercise. Well-known endurance rider Mike Hall was also struck and killed earlier this year while doing a race in Australia. And of course, you've probably seen the videos of Michelle Scarponi and his parrot riding on a training ride. He was also hit by a car earlier this year. Now, I've got many thousands of miles of commuting under my belt, and one of the things I did was buy video cameras for the front and back of my bike because I felt it made me safer. I would go through the footage after every commute and figure out exactly how each driver wronged me in some way. At first, this was enlightening because it made me realize how drivers see me and react to me, but soon it became a real problem. I would spend time on the road, enjoying the ride and having a few incidents here and there, but then I would go back and look at the footage and I'd get angry. I'd get mad at the people who almost hit me. I would get mad at the people who would stray into my lane. I'd get mad at the people I could see on their phone in my video camera. It was taking the fun out of my rides. That's why I decided that the only time I would look at the footage is if I really needed to. And now I set it up on a loop to where it gets erased after every ride. If you're venturing out into the video camera world and you want to record your rides, that's my advice to you. Don't look at the footage unless you have to. You'll be better off because of it and you'll enjoy your rides more. While I know that we're of the minority on the roads, and there are a lot of people that don't like us out there, and they're going to treat us badly, and they're going to bully us, it's important to know that things are changing. A recent letter from Roger Millar of the Washington State Department of Transportation summed it up best about how things are going to change. He sent the mail on May 19th with the subject, following up on how our agency regards bikes as a mode of transportation. This letter was posted on the Seattle Neighborhood Greenway's Facebook page last month. It starts... One of the many things I enjoy as secretary is communicating with you. Some of my messages come from my experience traveling the state and seeing firsthand your good work. Others are to increase your awareness about our goals and engage you in topics that might not be on your radar. I recently sent an employee message about May Bike Month, which promoted responses that got my attention. I want to be clear. I welcome the important, direct feedback from you about the direction we're going at WSDOT. One message stood out, as this employee believes bikes are a hazard and inconvenience to drivers. I feel compelled to clarify a few points about where we're going as an agency. At this point, Roger goes on with three specific bullet points about how WSDOT is changing, and these are great bullet points. The first one is, we are a multimodal agency. We are no longer a department of highways. We do not work for, quote, the drivers. We work for everyone using our transportation system via any mode. To not think of all the ways people use our system to meet their needs undercuts our work for inclusion. The highest rates of biking and walking are among the poorest of our people, people of color, immigrants, and others seeking safe access to opportunities and services. The next bullet point reads, Our work is full of opportunity. When you find yourself thinking about a stretch of road that is dangerous for one mode or another, that's your opportunity to think about solutions. Someone recently said on Twitter, If you see a cyclist on the sidewalk, Take a long, hard look at the road, then yell at the public works, not the cyclist. The person on the bike didn't create the infrastructure, but we do, and this is why practical solutions is one of our emphasis areas. The third bullet point reads, Transportation, bottom line, all transportation users are people. People on bikes, people walking, people on buses, people driving, and so forth. People on bicycles are using vehicles with just as much right to be on the right of way as cars and trucks. Hazard and inconvenience is only created by motorists and agencies not respecting the lives and values of all people. We're changing that every day in our work, for which I thank you. Roger closes his email with a strong message. We at WSDOT are stewards of a transportation system, not just a highway system. We have a responsibility to plan, design, build, operate, and maintain a transportation system that works safely and conveniently for the people we serve, regardless of how they get around. We all have our perspective and opinions, and we are a better agency for our diversity. 
That said, walking a mile in the other person's shoes or riding a mile on a bike might help you be even better at what you do. I want to continue this conversation and introduce you to our active transportation division. We'll work on a technology-based solution to have a virtual town hall of sorts and communicate those details to you soon. Thanks, as always, for your feedback and service. Roger Miller, Secretary of Transportation, Washington State Department of Transportation. It seems like a major change in how Washington State is viewing their transportation system. I've reached out to the Washington State Department of Transportation, and I hope to get Barb Chamberlain on a future show to talk about the Active Transportation Division. Until then, it's important for us as cyclists to realize that there are people in the system working on our behalf, just like they're working on the behalf of pedestrians and other road users. One of the things that we can do, if we don't want to just wait around, is get involved. Get involved at your local advisory level. Get involved in your community. Help people know that riding a bike is not weird. Help them know that riding a bike helps them in their car because you're giving up your parking spaces. You're giving them extra room on I-5 and I-90. Share your cycling stories with others who may not know what cycling is all about. Share your enthusiasm for what you're doing. That becomes infectious. And always, be vigilant on the roads, but enjoy your rides. Don't let bullying and intimidation from a select few people on the roads prevent you from riding your bike. That doesn't help anyone, and it's only going to make you sad. So focus on what you can control and help agencies and your community know what you need. Get involved. Between May 19th and June 21st, the Group Ride Podcast is giving away weekend passes to the Gigantic Bicycle Festival in Suquamish, Washington later this year. To enter, you simply post your amazing Pacific Northwest cycling photos on Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag iBikePNW and mention the Group Ride Pod. This week's winner for the two free passes goes to Boogie Studio 22. Congratulations, Boogie Studio. I'll be in touch on how to get your weekend passes sent out to you. We'll be selecting two more winners over the next two weeks, so get out there and take some photos. You can find out more about how to enter by going to thegroupride.com slash iBikePNW. If you spend enough time on the east side of Seattle riding a bike, you're likely to run across a very memorable rider. This rider is memorable because of his chosen bike. He rides a bright yellow Velomobile, which for the uninitiated looks something like a soapbox derby car, but with two wheels up front and one in the back. The rider of this eye-catching machine is Wing Lee, and I took notice of him on his Velomobile back in 2014. Wing was cruising up one of the steeper hills on the east side, Brickyard Road, at the Bothell Woodenville border. This hill is no slouch at an average of 8% for just over a half a mile, and to be riding up it on what looked like a 75-pound box was amazing to me. I recently ran across a picture I took that day of Wing and his Velomobile, so I cast a wide net across my cycling network to try to track down the rider of what many call the banana bike. I found him, and we met in Woodenville, Washington to chat. I am here in Woodenville, Washington with a bike rider who lots of you have probably seen because he rides a very memorable bike. I've seen him a number of times out on my rides, uh, and he actually used to ride a lot around a place I lived uh, in Bothell, Washington. I'm here with Wing Lee. He rides a Velomobile. So, Wing, thanks for being on the show. Hi, Wes. Tell me a little bit about the machine that you ride. We call it a Velomobile. Actually, it is a recumbent bike with a fiberglass hard shell as a fairing. And uh, it rides like a recumbent with two wheels in the front and one back wheel. How long have you been riding this? Uh, I got it for five years. A little bit over five years, as a matter of fact. Now, were you a regular bike rider before this? Did you like ride recumbents? What made you go to a Velomobile? <laughs> well, I wasn't a regular bike rider uh, before. And I just happened to see it on the internet. And then I, I was really interesting. And then I started to look up what kind of manufacturers and where could I get it. And then I, eventually I settled on this one. And did you get it imported? Yes. Uh, this one was made in Canada, but it was designed in Netherlands. So have you ever ridden a regular bike before or is this your only bike? Uh, yeah, I rode in a regular bike before, but not really that often, just once in a while. This, you pedal like a normal bike, yes, but it's like a, like a recumbent. How do you steer it? Uh, that's like a, a tiller, they call it, that I twist, that is steer the front wheel. So it's pretty much like a car, it's steer the front. How do you find riding on the roads with this machine? Does it get a lot of looks? Do cars give you more room? How does that work for you? Uh, in general, 
our cars give me more room because a lot of them they've never seen me before and it's just the novelty and usually when I ride I ride on the bike lane and it's a lot safer that way but during the group ride we rode on the road and uh, it is safe with a group of riders what is the longest ride you've done with this uh, the longest one I rode with the uh, Cascade a bike club uh, on one on one of those group ride. It was about sixty miles. Okay, that's pretty cool. And where do you keep all your gear? I would imagine I don't see a trunk. So I would imagine <laughs> no. you keep it in the shell somewhere. Yes, uh, you know I got my normal tools to f- to fix the bike in in case that something happens. And then I got water bottle, and then I got food and knickknacks. So so if you do get a flat, how easy is it to actually get the wheel off to change a flat? Well, it is not bad. I don't need to get the wheel off because it is uh, side-mounted. Oh, great. So all I need is to uh, flip it on the side and I can just uh, get the tire off. And how often do you ride? Like, what is your mileage per week? Uh, right now, I ride pretty much every day, about maybe 20 to 30 miles a day. Man, that is a lot for that machine. How much does it weigh? Uh, it weighed about 80 pounds, that, so it is heavy. That is very heavy. Uh, that means you probably go pretty fast downhill. Downhill and on flat is a little bit easier to ride than a regular bike, but not going uphill because of the weight. Right, so it's super aerodynamic on the flat. It's super weight sensitive going downhill, so you go fast. But on, mm-hmm. the, on the climbs, I, I've seen you pushing it up Brickyard Road Hill, which is about 13% at, at its worst case. Mm-hmm. I think it's averaging around 8 I have a hard time climbing that on a regular bike. I can't imagine taking 80 pounds up that hill. Well, the advantage of this is I don't need to keep the balance. Oh, that's true. And I can go very slow. And if I'm really, really tired, I can always stop, take a break, and then continue. But usually I can make up the brickyard road, no problem. Cool. Uh, And it takes regular cycling gears, like the regular group set you would have on a normal bike, like it has a normal gear set in the back where you can put a pretty big cassette so you can have a lot of climbing gears? Well, actually, right now at the back, I have 1128. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I can put a bigger cassette there because I need a longer cage okay. and it might rub against the body. So I haven't tried that yet. So it's very similar to a normal bike. I have the same problem. I have a 1128 on my, my mm-hmm. road bike and I can't go higher unless I put a longer cage on as well. Right. And is the front a double or is it a triple? It's a triple. Uh, I believe it's 53, 44, 30 okay. on the front. And what made you go for this bright yellow paint job? What was the choice there? <laughs> well, it's for the visibility. It works. Because of, for the safety, uh, I think a bright color would work well and people can see it far away. And usually when I ride it, I ride with lights also. Right. So I got uh, two lights at the front and then one main headlight and then the tail light at the back. Now, before we started the interview, you had mentioned there was at least one other person that you knew that was riding a similar mobile. Do you guys have a club, like some kind of meeting? <laughs> or? <laughs> no, not really. Um, I met that fellow maybe sometime last year and at that time he, he didn't buy a Villamobile yet. Uh, so we kind of chat and then I said, you know, it is kind of fun to ride it. And then he started to look around and then finally found one and then he bought it. And last time I saw him, it was maybe two weeks ago and uh, he had it set up and actually he had uh, an electric assist oh, installed. Nice. That's, yeah. that's pretty smart. Yeah. So that helps. Do you find yourself getting stopped a lot by people who are just interested in talking about your bike? Oh, yes. Um, uh, a lot of people, they find it very interesting. And then, you know, like, like uh, we stop and then we chat a bit. And as a matter of fact, I got pulled over by a policeman <laughs> one time because I was on a bike lane a little bit downhill. So I was going uh, maybe a little bit faster than a bike. <laughs> so she saw me and maybe she figured I had a motor in it. Right. And then she stopped me and asked me for a driver's license. And I go, no, I'm riding a bike. <laughs> and then... She goes, well, it is motorized. And I said, no, it is all paddled. And she didn't believe me. And she actually had to poke her head in and saw oh, the uh, the paddle. And then she believed me. That's hilarious. Did she have a laugh or did she feel oh, embarrassed? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, so what is your big plan this year for any rides? Are you going to do any longer events? Or are you just going to ride your 20 to 30 miles a day? Well, um, five years ago when I first bought it, I actually signed up for the STP. And I was going to go for it. And then unfortunately, uh, in February, I had a crash. And then I have to put that plan off. And since then, I just 
you know, I <laughs> didn't really feel like for a long ride. Right, right. Well, that's really cool. Um, I, I know that anybody who has seen you will remember you. Um, I'm going to take a picture of your Velomobile with you in it before mm. we go. So okay, I can put sure. it on the website so people, when they see you out and about, they can wave at you <laughs> uh, so they know that they heard you on the podcast. Yeah, sure. That's really cool. Well, I appreciate you being on the show. This is awesome. All right. Thank you, Wes. Thanks for listening to episode 16 of the Group Ride Podcast. To send me feedback about the show, ask a question, or request that I cover a specific topic, contact me on Twitter and Instagram at The Group Ride Pod or on Facebook at The Group Ride Podcast. If you're the adventurous type and want to be on the show, leave me a voicemail message at 206-651-4161. Make sure you join The Group Ride Club to get some Group Ride Podcast gear and get us one member closer to unlocking the custom Group Ride Podcast jersey. You can sign up at thegroupride.com slash club. I'm your host, Wes Salmon. See you on the next group ride.